Welcome back to the Plowcast. This is episode five of the series covering the latest issue of the magazine, Made Perfect. Today, we'll be speaking with Kelsey Osgood about the joys and complexities of raising an Orthodox Jewish family in, but not of, the surrounding secular city. And with Leah Labresco about the good of dependence. I'm Peter Momsen, Editor-in-Chief of Plow. And I'm Susanna Black, Senior Editor at Plow. This is the episode where we talk about religious community, the value of living by God's law, and the good of dependence. First off, Kelsey Osgood. Kelsey is a writer whose memoir of an eating disorder, How to Disappear Completely, was published in 2013. She has been published in the New York Times, New York Magazine, Harper's, and many other places, including repeatedly in Plow. She is currently working about a book about millennial woman converts to demanding religious traditions. She lives in the Bronx with her family. Welcome, Kelsey. The piece that we're mostly going to be talking about now is called Stranger in a Strange Land. Um... The slug line is, even in Brooklyn, our Orthodox Jewish family feels alien. That's not all bad. And this piece covers a lot of ground that we kind of tend to circle back around to a lot in, you know, in the magazine. Um, you know, we, the magazine did a launch for Rod Dreyer's book, The Benedict Option, back when it first came out. And so the question of religious separatism, building intense religious communities that are in some way protected from or insulated from the outside world and how that is good, how that can go wrong, how we should think about all of that is something that we're often drawn back to. And is separatism even the right word? Uh, and this is a, something that I hope we can get into. Um, or is rather the language of creative minorities, um, which I believe uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs wrote a beautiful piece a few uh, years ago for First Things on creative minorities playing with Toynbee's uh, term about how by building a thick community on the edges of society and yet in touch with it, that can actually lead to renewal for the society that surrounds it. So all these, all these things are sort of in your piece um, implicitly and partly explicitly, Kelsey. Love to get into them a little more. Uh, it would be just great, though, before we do, um, could you just kind of tell us your own story? Uh, what, what led you to become the mother of an Orthodox Jewish family feeling alien or not in Brooklyn? So I was born and raised in suburban Connecticut um, in a community that was a community and a family that was, I would say, um, largely in, indifferent to religion, um, sort of secularized American Christians. Um, it was a very homogenous place, uh, socioeconomically, a very white upper middle class place, um, which was fine in many respects. Um, uh, it, it, in, it was not a great fit for me. The defining feature of my childhood personality and probably in many ways my personality today is a uh, preoccupation with existential questions. When I was a kid, that really manifested as, you know, the sort of typical, why are we all here? What are we supposed to do when we're here? Isn't it weird that we were just born and now we're walking around and nobody's talking about how odd that is? Um, what are what are good and bad? Are they relative values? This kind of stuff. And um, when I was younger, I think I really characterized my environment as being really hostile to that in, uh, kind of existential inquiry. But the truth is, I'm not actually sure if that's the case. I just remember that nobody really ever seemed to wonder about these things. Nobody really ever expressed them. There were no venues in which to... Um, to dive into this stuff, um, it and and that I think led to some. I, I think directly led to a lot of the struggles that I had as a teenager. Um, I had I I had an eating disorder as a teenager, which is a lot of what my f first book is about. And I think looking back on it, I see my attraction to. An eating disorder is really about a kind of yearning for the sort of overarching ethical structure that I felt like was lacking in my community of birth. 
I'm not the first person to make a comparison to anorexia and religion. It has happened a lot, but there are obvious parallels. There's rules, there's a sense of good and bad, there's um, you know, a clear sort of purpose uh, and goal to one's life. There's a sense of focus. Even in the late 90s and early 2000s when this was, which was when I was dealing with this, there was even a nascent kind of community because the internet has just started. So there was a way to kind of plug in to other people who were also dealing with eating disorders. Um, in college, and I did, throughout this time, I really considered myself an atheist. I was, I was, a, I considered myself an atheist starting around the age of eight. It was a very logical argument in my mind. You can't see God. You can't hear Him. Therefore, He must not exist. He must be a tool on the part of adults. I was when I was a kid. I was very into this idea that adults made things up for children in order to keep them uh, in line. It was a sort of like. Marxist idea, you know, that um, like school, I, I really didn't like school. And so I thought that school was just kind of this structure that adults had made up and it put us there to, to learn things that were not very valuable in order to, to control us, you know. So I thought God ser must serve the same purpose. Um, and I think that when I was, uh, so then when I was in college and I was dealing with yet again another bout of illness, um, and really, at the time, I was really borrowing from a lot of what I was learning in school, a lot of postmodern thought, a lot of, you know, sort of your life and your truth are what you decide that they are. And there's no sort of inherent moral structure to the universe other than the one that you make. Um, and this led to a really scary nihilist a moment of, of realizing of feeling like nihilism was the end was going to be the inevitable end result here right like that that i had this problem i wanted to not have it and yet i continued to do it and so maybe this was just the way that i was supposed to live and that meant all sorts of terrible things that i was probably going to die pretty young that i was probably not going to have a family or any sort of real job or life and that must be because I was because I was doing these things that must be what I want and nobody was in any moral position to tell me that that was the wrong thing to do and then I had a sort of you know what you might call a kind of moment of a white light you know AA type moment where there was a part of me that went oh that is totally wrong there there's there can that cannot be right and that was sort of this beginning of turning back towards this idea that there is something larger than me as an individual and individuals and their own lowercase t truths and and that really opened up the door for me to to have a real life again I guess. Um, <clears throat> and then I'm going to fast forward a bit because I, I think I'm lingering a little too long. Um, I first came into contact with Orthodox Judaism, which I knew nothing about before this because there were no, essentially no Jews where I um, grew up. Um, my first introduction was in college and then actually weirdly in uh, the places where, places where I was hospitalized. There were a lot of religious Jews and I was very intrigued by them. Um, I had no clue that it was, I didn't even know I think that it was possible to be that religious at all. Like I, I knew that priests existed, obviously I knew what a nun was, but there was, the idea that there was, this, there was this community of people who lived in close proximity to me who were religious was like, really, I, I just didn't know it was a thing. Um, I, remain very interested in a sort of half anthropological half you know mostly sort of scholarly I guess I would have described at the time way with orthodox Judaism from that point in time so I was like 18 19 um, up until around the age of 26 at the time at three in that time I went to visit a friend who was living in Israel and found that to be a very moving experience 
I started dating my then boyfriend, now husband, when I was about 26. Um, and he is Jewish by birth. He was raised to reform, um, which is, uh, I'm sure everyone knows this, but you know, the more, the, the largest and, and largely considered to be the most um, liberal or one of the more liberal outside of Reconstructionist and Renewal, which are um, sort of smaller movements to the left of reform. Um, he was raised reform. And around that time is when I really started considering, okay, do I really, you know, this is going to be a part of my life in one way or another. If this is the person I'm going to marry, you know, he has a strong Jewish identity, even if he's not observant in the way that an Orthodox Jew would define it. And he is going to want to raise his children with some sort of Jewish identity. So I started studying and reading and speaking to rabbis and forming friendships with rabbis uh, probably I would say about maybe a year and a half to two years into our relationship is when I really started to grapple with this, oh no, I think I actually want to do an Orthodox conversion, which most people from the outside think, oh, well, it makes sense to convert to Judaism if your husband is Jewish because, you know, the, it's the trope. They, you know, the grandparents want you to have Jewish grandchildren or whatever. It's from... From this perspective, it's actually, in some ways, it's actually much more complicated than if I had done nothing at all. His parents, being strong Reform Jews, believe in patrilineal descent. My children would have been Jewish to them regardless of whether or not I had converted. And when you become Orthodox, that takes a whole new lifestyle, set of lifestyle challenges that, um, that are... are are a headache for everybody. Um, and, and there's actually, you know, there's some, there's probably a clever name for this in social psychology or something. Sometimes when somebody is close enough to you, um, maybe the difference is, it's not narcissism of small differences, but the difference is great more. There's, there's sometimes there's, 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 um, there's more frustration from, um, from reform or Orthodox Jews about, um, other other denominations of Judaism than there is about, I don't know, Hindus or something, you know? It, it, there's The proximity creates a kind of, people feel like they're being judged maybe for their actions. So there is, so there is, it was complicated. Um, you know, my, Matt, who's my husband at the time, when I first told him, when I first, you know, came out of the closet and said like, I, I actually think I wanna do an Orthodox conversion, it was not an easy conversation. He was not, super happy about this um and for a while the first right before we got married I I was really thinking we were going to have you know a Jewish but interfaith relationship where I would be keeping Shabbat on a Saturday and doing my thing and he would work if he needed to or be on his phone and maybe he'd do it in another room and it would be respectful but it wouldn't we would not have the same practices that's not how it worked out. He eventually, or not long after we got married, he started keeping Shabbat. And, you know, it's this rabbi that I'm friendly with, friendly with likes to say it's an, it's an evolution, not a revolution. I converted now six, it'll, this coming year, it'll be seven years ago. And that's, then you add three years on top of that, of the study and the actual conversion process leading up to the mikvah, which is the conclusion of that. And there have been incremental changes over the years sometimes you don't even realize that they're happening to the point where now I'm 37 and sometimes you know I'm I t I'm tearing up my toilet paper on Friday afternoon before Shabbat and I'm like oh my gosh how did this happen how did I get here you know who, who, how did I become this person who does this I mean it's it's great and it's wonderful and I love it but but there's something very surprising about you know going on this journey and sometimes you don't even realize um how far you've moved in certain respects. So I, I think that's my general story. And now I have two children. They go to Jewish school. They they keep kosher. This is the the you know the water they swim in. It's not it's not strange to them. Um, and it'll be interesting. They're they're too young. It'll be interesting. Sometimes I think about you know when I have to you know tell them like oh you know this wasn't always the way that it was. Um, it'll be interesting to see their relationship to Judaism um, and how it's different from mine and, and even my husband's, I think. Speaking of your, your kids, one of the story, the anecdotes you tell in, in your piece, uh, Strangers in a Strange Land, is uh, I think has to do with Halloween. Hmm. Yeah. 
Um, could you talk a bit about some of the, the com- you know, sort of what's it like to not celebrate Halloween? I, I think about this all the time, especially as when that, when I, the, the incident that I wrote about, my son was only, my older son, now I have two sons, was only 18 months old. Now he's four and a half and he's a very precocious kid and he notices everything. And this is less this, the case now that we live in a, in a neighborhood that is, um, I, you know, I don't want to overstate it. I don't live in, in the heart of South Williamsburg or, you know, in a sort of Americanized shtetl. Um, but, it, but it's a pretty religious neighborhood. There's a, there's a high concentration of Orthodox Jews here. So we don't get trick-or-treaters. We don't see a lot of Halloween decorations. But when we do, I can see my four-year-old really trying to work out you know, and he talks about it. He'll say, he'll say, oh, he, he's clearly fascinated by the decorations and the macabreness of it generally. Um, and I can see him like being interested, but not really wanting to show me that he's interested. And, and he'll say things like, I hate Halloween. And I'll always say, I'll say, you know, it's full of nuance. It's probably totally above his head, but I'll say, you know, Isaiah, it's, like it, it, Halloween is not a bad thing and people who celebrate it are not bad. It's just that we don't celebrate it because we have our own holidays and different people have different holidays. And, and he, he'll pair. Oh yes, that's, that's right. It's, it's okay. You know, but he, but that, that sort of delicate balance of particularity is, 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 it's so hard. It's hard for me as an adult. And I think, um, I do wonder, you know, I think like if you're somebody who lives in South Williamsburg and your kids just never or rarely interact, have this kind of experience where they're confronted with part of American culture that they can't participate in, or maybe they have it and they are told explicitly, no, that's a bad thing. You don't do that because it's bad. And the people who who do do it are bad or they're just it's irrelevant it's not worthy of consideration don't think about what other people do sometimes I feel like maybe that's easier than trying to explain to to kids um you know that that different people have different things and that's okay um I don't know we'll we'll see how it turns out I, I don't think I could do that because I don't believe it I don't believe that it's okay to say that other people are bad or wrong for celebrating things in different ways. For me, as somebody who's always felt a little bit countercultural and has a little bit of, does feel that there is value in standing outside of um, mainstream American consumerist um, life in many ways. I, I, there's a part of me that that feels a little bit invigorated by this protest mentality that I'm not doing this thing because I can tell you the reasons why I don't think it's correct or whatever. Um, but my children might not have that. I don't know. Or they, or as somebody who had all this stuff available to her as a young person, maybe it's, there's, there's no novelty there. There's something, there could be something very exciting for them about the novelty of this thing that's off limits. Um, a lot we'll have to see um in my particular case um yeah I don't know if that answers your question I'm trying I'm gonna like let Pete keep us more on track because I feel like I am so tempted to go off on 11,000 rabbit trails right now possibly you and I will just like have to have coffee in the city at some point a lot of what you're describing is just like very familiar to me um the you know the way the kind of Judaism that I was raised with, which is sort of like vaguely atheist or agnostic, um, you know, red diaper baby Judaism, um, with lots of vagals on the Upper West Side, um, existential questions and existential crises are like very accepted and encouraged. The problem comes when you find answers to them, and that that's like very taboo. Um, and whether those answers are Orthodox Judaism or Christianity, it's like kind of equally taboos it would freak out your parents no matter what my cousin um actually did convert to modern orthodoxy from this you know vagueness and that freaked his parents out um my parents freaked out when i converted to christianity but i think that what's fascinating to me uh, by what uh, about what you're describing in particular is this sense of a non-moralistic separatism so a separatism that has to do with this is who we are but we're not saying 
you know, that Halloween is itself bad because that's not actually something that you see in among evangelicals who won't celebrate Halloween. Like evangelicals who won't celebrate Halloween don't say, you know, that's just not who we are. We have other um, traditions. They say it's bad. And that's a fascinatingly different kind of way of making a, an alternate community, like the non-moralistic way of making an alternate community. Um, the other thing that I was sort of thinking about I, I don't know, I guess I just I'd like you to talk about that a little bit more, like the non-moralistic way of um, understanding um, this kind of communal formation. And I guess you don't really have a, a Christian background to compare it to, but just how, what's that what's that like? What's the experience of having a separate but not sort of in a way non-judgmental um, community? So part of this is just related to the structure of Judaism. Um, and Peter mentioned before um, Jonathan Sachs. There, there are some there's some amazing writing out there on the topic. Um, Jonathan Sachs has written a lot about this in his, particularly in his book, Dignity of Difference. But you can also, his website has a lot of um, his speeches, the transcriptions of his speeches and stuff. Um, that dive into this topic. There's also an academic called John D. Levinson who wrote an essay called The Universal Horizon of Biblical Particularism, um, which is a, a, a fascinating, um, if rather scholarly, I mean, that's not everyone's taste, um, but uh, work that, that dives into this a little bit. Um, I think it's interesting because the non-moralistic part, I think that some of, if I can make a sort of bold pronouncement, maybe it's not that provocative, but you know, some of, some a lot of anti-semitism or or some anti-semitism comes from this idea that because jews are or orthodox jews let's say mostly because orthodox jews are live together um for the most part um that and because they have this rhetoric that you can find in the torah of chosenness separateness holiness that differentiates them from other people even if as levinson makes the argument it's not actually value laden in the torah if you go back to the original sources but but it's hard not to it, you know by the time that filters down to the average person it sounds value laden so let's take it that way these people think that jews must judge them in the same way that you're mentioning that evangelicals who don't celebrate Halloween expect that all people should celebrate Halloween. But Jews don't believe that all non-Jewish people should do the same thing that Jews do. Jews have a certain set of laws or mitzvot that apply to them. There are 613 of them. And a certain set of laws and mitzvot that apply to non-Jewish people. There are seven. From a Jewish perspective, if you follow those seven laws, that makes you, you know, you are fulfilling an ethical purpose. You are living an ethical life. There's no reason that you should have to, to, to become Jewish. And this is, you know, ties into the non-proselytizing nature of Judaism. Um, I, you know, I mean, it's this, I guess a sort of, unrelated or maybe I'm jumping ahead here I, it was so interesting to me so I so we moved to the Bronx to Riverdale in about a year ago and a fr over the summer last year a friend of mine uh who I know from college um who very smart works in LA as a tv writer she came up to visit my family and I for a day and I made an offhand comment about oh you know it, it's 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 much more convenient in many ways to live here. I mean, it, speaking purely logistically, um, because we live in we live in close proximity to so many shuls, and and that's that's the the you know that's what you need for a good Jewish community. If you can't walk to shul on a Shabbat, you can't live there because um, you have no way of getting to your house of worship. And she was <laughs> this is a person who grew up, I think, in the Washington D.C. area and went to school in New York. She said, "Oh my gosh, I never." I never considered that. I always thought that Jews just lived together because um, they didn't like other people. <laughs> um, and I was like, oh no, I mean, you know, I don't want to overstate it. Like there is, I'm sure there, there's xenophobia within within Jewish communities and there's, and there's fear, fear about living, um, you know, 
uh, when you're when you're um, a minority and you're you you know you feel you've faced historical danger um you maybe you maybe want to live closed off that feels safer um but it, the logistical side of it had really never occurred to her which i thought was really sort of remarkable um i think you know i mean jews would religious jews would ha- would feel that a secular halakhic jew meaning a a Jew person who was born to a jewish mother would be categorically incorrect to do something like let's say celebrate christmas they would pass judgment on that but they don't pass judgment on um on non-jews who do um who who follow the noahide commandments and in fact there's a lot of jewish writing i mean even all the way up to maimonides that really speaks in in uh very positive terms about particularly Christianity and Islam, because Judaism is very uh, passionate about people becoming monotheistic. And many um, celebrated Jewish writers throughout Jewish history have really thought that, you know, Christianity and in particular Islam actually, um, you know, were forces for spreading monotheism through the world in a way that Judaism as a tiny tribal non-proselytizing faith could never have accomplished. so, um, I don't know though. I mean, it, it's, it's really hard because I think of this in terms of my own family. I mean, my, my, my family of not my, my husband and my children, but my, my parents and my siblings and their children, you know, like think like in terms of something like keeping kosher and not being able to just go over to their house and eat whatever food that they're eating. Now, I can say all that I want. This doesn't have anything to do with, you know, how good your kitchen is or how good your cooking is or how good of a person you are. I can give you all the theological reasons why you shouldn't be offended by this. But I think that it is hard to not feel that there is something in there that is at the very least difficult to understand. Um and f- might feel a little personal. This might not come out right as a question, but as you were talking, um, especially as I was sort of thinking about keeping kosher, um, so obeying the Noahide commandments, um, it, they're, you know, it's, it's kind of a generalized, they're, they're quite general, they're not specific. Mm-hmm. Um, as a way of like dealing with something like your eating disorder, I mean, the one that would sort of apply is the one against murder, so which would include self-murder. But that's mm-hmm. so like that. It seems to me that the kind of specific food laws in Judaism, where what you're hearing from God is, no, even if you want to restrict what you eat, even if you want to, um, you know, apparently because you're doing it, you must want to. Um, you know, essentially harm your own health by, by your eating practices. That's not what eating is for. And God actually has things in mind for what good eating is and what eating is for. And in part, that is to give you strength to serve him and serve your family and, you know, way enough to maintain a pregnancy and that kind of thing. And the way that like, um, kind of receiving those more specific laws as, you know, something like that pushes against your will and shows you more specifically what God wills for you in general as a person, like your own thriving and your own flourishing. Um, I just, does, is that part of what your experience was at I think, all? Like, okay, and, when I first converted, there was a part of me that felt like that keeping kosher was going to be the most difficult thing because it was reminiscent of an anorexic structure uh, or an anorexic worldview. Even if, I'm going to be totally honest, I think that I knew, even at the time that I was, that my fears were overblown, <laughs> that I, I, I thought, I was like, oh, I'm so fragile, I can't do this. But that, that was just really not the case. I was still really, I was still really stuck in a mindset that, that valued fragility, if that makes sense. Like that was a, that, that, um, that wanted to be that way, but actually was, was really, um, I didn't want to acknowledge my own my own resilience. I think, um, even though I was sort of moving away from from that uh, mindset. I mean, to me, the and I was just talking about this earlier with someone. I'm not sure I'm answering your question exactly, but um, 
But yeah, a lot of people, I, I think this comes up a little like, oh, isn't it triggering? This person, somebody asked me this today. Um, aside from the fact that it's been nearly two decades since I was hospitalized and, and a, at least a decade since I really would have considered myself eating disordered in any real way. Um, I think part of the the genius of Judaism is that it doesn't, is that it, it forces you to be disciplined, like even about your discipline, if that makes sense. Um, you know, it's, it, there is this structure in place that says, okay, you know, you're a human, you're an animal. It's very, it's very acknowledging of, of individual, of people's animal natures, right? Um, you know, we're not, we, we, it, there's, there's very little ascetic, um, asceticism in Judaism. Um, you know, you should be eating, but you know, you can't be a glutton and the whole world is not there for your culinary pleasure. You have to exercise your discipline in these particular ways. Um, this comes up around food in the same way that it comes up around sex, the same way that it comes up around repentance. You know, you repent. I mean, you were there, you know, the obvious one being Yom Kippur, that here we have this day where you're going to, you know, think about all the things that you've, or this period of time, really, that, you know, the, um, the days, the leading up to Yom Kippur, you're, you're thinking about the things that you've done wrong and you're apologizing to other people for them. But you're not, you know, there's no hair shirt. You're not supposed to be self-flagellating all the time. Um, and, and for me, there's, there's parts of the inner of my, my des desire for anorexia that were not necessarily wrong in, the, in and of themselves. It's not wrong to want to be self-disciplined and it's not wrong to want to examine your own flaws, but it becomes a kind of weird backward narcissism when all you do is examine your own flaws and discipline yourself to, you know, as if you are, you know, thinking that you're the world's worst person is is kind of grandiose in a in an analogous way to thinking you're the world's best person. So, um, so the it, it, Judaism, I you know, espouses a real moderation in, in this in this respect. And I was just reading something about I think it's in Kohelet. Um, you know, he says um, you're even supposed to do that about your own piety. You're not really even supposed to be. You're not supposed to be so sanctimonious about your own you know, piety, even that you really aren't supposed to, to overdo. Um, so I think it's a balancing force in, in my own life, actually. Um, would that have been the case had it been something that I was raised with? Um, I, you know, I can't say that. I wonder that sometimes, um, especially since I feel like I know people for whom it was not. They felt it was, a, it was restrictive for them. For me, it doesn't feel that way. Well, as, as someone who was raised in a in a community uh, that was very different. You know, I was raised in the Rudolph community. I dressed different when I went to high school. Um, I always, you know, I think anyone who grows up like that with a different set of values, a different set of experiences and references, uh, we never watched television, we, did, we couldn't catch any of the pop culture references. Um, of course, there's a, a, a resentment mm -hmm. against that as a teenager. Um, and yet, that's precisely what I want for my kids. I want them to actually go through the resentment um, because I believe that if you are able to come through it, and of course not everyone does, right? But if you're able to come through it, then you find the value of um, struggling through. What does this mean? What, what, uh, what is my relationship to this tradition that I come from? And what obligations does it put on me? Mm -hmm. And I think there's, there's always going to be that moment of free will um, in passing on a faith, um, a tradition to the next generation, that there is that moment of, of, of free fall where they're going to have to decide, are they going to lean into the resentment and, and sort of anger and the sense of hemmed inness um, and the, the sense of not being at home, fully at home in the world mm -hmm. until you realize that it's really good not to feel too at home in the world. Mm -hmm. um, when... And, and I, you know, some kids are going to go one way, some another. But early, earlier in this uh, process of working on this beautiful essay that you wrote, Kelsey, uh, you and I were talking about a, a series of stories we both read about um, congregations of converted Orthodox Jews in Bogota, Colombia. Uh, 
and it ties into what I was just saying, at least it did for me, I, some, I somehow could recognize a, a longing uh, that was leading these Pentecostal churches. I believe there's over 50 convert Orthodox Jewish synagogues in uh, various levels of, uh, I, I guess, uh, I'm not sure how recognized they are, but this is how they view themselves. Um, and for them, uh, from what I understand, a big part of the driver was how do we pass on this faith to the next generation? Um, where is the thickness of community that allows us to be a people? And so for them, they, they, it was more important to be a people uh, than to even stick to uh, acknowledgement of Jesus, right? And so they, they converted over. Um, we've talked with, this is something we've talked a lot about uh, with different religions. Uh, we've published a piece by Shadi Hamid about um, Muslim communities doing the same um, in, in a sort of liberal culture that seems to dissolve difference, that seems to despise the idea certainly of um, that kind of non-moralistic separatism that you were talking about. Um, you almost need to build these structures, right? Uh, of course, in Orthodox Judaism, that geographic proximity is, is kind of forced. Uh -huh. um, for others, it needs to be chosen. I'm just wondering... Have you have you looked around also in, in the the process of researching your your current book? Um, why is it that people are looking for those kinds of thick communities? And um, do you have any kind of insights into what would make those good versus bad forms of separatism? I mean, I can theorize as to why people are looking <clears throat> for thick communities, and also I would say. Um, for um, wisdom that they might consider ancient or historical. Um, I think that, I mean, it, it might be a little bit of a cliche to say at this point, but <clears throat> I think that there is a lot about contemporary life that is so, that we are so, um, that people are so separate from one another, that the, the old um, models of um, continuity have been so disrupted. You know, people, um, now the pandemic might actually have changed some people's relationship to this kind of thing, but, you know, people um, moving to one's hometown or staying in one's hometown being sort of seen as a mark of, um, you know, failure in some ways, um, the rise of the internet, um, people not having relationships with one another that exist in the real world, that only exist on the internet. And I, I'm a pretty big tech skeptic, even though I think it's kind of boring to knock big tech in a lot of ways. But I think that, that people really want to know each other in, in a way that goes beyond having a colleague or having a friend on Facebook or going to college with, with one another. And I, I mean, the thing I always think about when I think about this sort of thing is you'll notice like in a lot of very simple consumer transactions in the 21st century, um, the big marketing ploy is to, you know, you go online, let's say, and you want to buy a coffee pot and you buy, you pick, you find one and you buy it and you even, whether or not you sign up for the email list or if they're going to send you an email and in, they, they are inevitably going to be like, welcome. You're, we're so glad you're part of our community. I'm like community. I just wanted to buy something. This is like a really, this is a simple thing. We don't have to keep in touch, you know, but I think that, or, or this is like a really, um, you know, I, it, I, I was, it's a long story, but I ended up on a subreddit the other day, a subreddit that's related to a TV show. And I've never, I have, I've had never seen what online fandom looks like before. I, I did not know that it could exist like this. And the sort of enormously emotive, over-the-top ways that people were talking about this, literally a subreddit de 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 dedicated to a television show, People were like, I just love you guys so much. I'm so happy we're all in this together. And I mean, 
maybe this is like not particularly kind of me or something, but I was like, wow, people are really hungry for that kind of connection. And sure, it's exacerbated by the pandemic, but I think the pandemic has actually just made people realize that what they had before that wasn't that great either. You know, um, when you're, when you live in a religious community, I mean, and how, you know, there are various levels of thickness, um, and I'm sure people who grew up in my com- in the community where I live now might feel that maybe I'm overstating it. But there, but there's a certain you know you really are you really there is an immediate sort of familiarity and an immediate willingness on the part of most people um, to be part of one another's lives in a way that is um, um, not abstract. I mean, you know, to pick one example. <laughs> My, my father-in-law died, um, August, 2020, wait, August, 2020. Yes. August, 2020. Um, and we, we moved here and, and since we've moved here, you know, when someone dies in the Jewish tradition, if you're a mourner, if you're, um, a, a spouse or a child of that, the person who's deceased, you don't leave your house. You stay in your house for seven days and the prayer quorum the uh, you know, a, baseline 10 men makes a minion comes to your house right so my husband because he's he has recently experiences experienced a loss makes a point of going to shiva minions in the neighborhood so he's showing up for people that he maybe has never met before by virtue of us having moved here during the pandemic to be with them in their in the, their moments of like horrible grief and it was very interesting to me to see in the aftermath of my father-in-law's death, um, at the time we were not living here yet, but we, we knew many people here and we knew we were moving here. So we were kind of a part of this community, you know, the ways in which people raised with that kind of framework knew sort of automatically what to do, um, and how to show up and the ways in which people who didn't really did not know really were, were at a complete loss. I mean, this this goes for when someone has a baby, you know, the big sort of life things, um, not to mention having Shabbat, which is a, which is a huge um, bonding, I, I, that's the wrong word, it sounds kind of corny the way I'm saying it, but but you know, these, we have these sort of this, this ritual life that is in many ways very demanding, um, uh, because it's very time intense. There's a lot of, you know, we have a lot of holidays. We do Shabbat once a week. And there's the baseline expectation that, you know, you invite people to your house, they invite you to their house, and you don't even necessarily have to know somebody that well for that to happen. It's just kind of expected. It's part of the way that you create um, create this. And I, I feel that I don't know that there's really an analogous, you know, I haven't heard of these kinds of um, um, life, this kind of life, these kinds of behaviors, this 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 way of being together. I don't see it outside of religious communities. I I don't see it there. Um, and I have mo- most of my social network is pre religiosity. I was already in my mid to late twenties when I started converting. And so most of my friends are not religious people or my friends from, you know, early on in my life. And I don't hear, you know, I've never heard them say things that amounts, yes, I, we do, you know, or I do X thing um, that provides me with this sense of community. Um, and in terms of when it's done well, oh, gosh, I mean, I, I, Obviously, I like to think that like the way I'm like, well, the way I do it is the well is the way that it's good. Um, <laughs> um, or, you know, I think like there are there are benefits and disadvantages to all to all, you know, ways of doing it. Like I said before, I think when I see when I look at the uh, when I either when I'm reading about or when I visit communities where it's it's more insular, more small C conservative, whatever you want to say. If you're talking about certain sex of Hasidim or um, certain strains of Anabaptism, like the Amish or whatever, you know, the 
the advantage there is that when it's so demanding and so insular, there is less of a risk that somebody is going to walk away. The disadvantage is if that, if that per, like a child, for example, if a child wants to walk away, their fall is likely to be much from a much higher place. Meaning like that they're, that, that then they have, will have a much harder time in the main, in the dominant mainstream culture by virtue of having not gotten the same, the necessary kind of schooling, um, just, and, and the cultural barriers that one has to overcome when one comes from an environment like that. I mean, it, it, I, I, I don't want under, to underestimate that that can be really hard. So for me, I feel like in some ways what we do as a family is we're kind of, you know, we're kind of hedging our bets a little bit. We, you know, my, my kids, they go to a Jewish school, but they go to a Jewish school that teaches them secular subjects as well. They're, they're likely to go to college, I guess. I mean, who knows what college will look like in 15 years. Uh, um, but they're, they're, you know, that we're, we're preparing them to, as if they will go to college. Um, and the dangers there are inherent, right? What if they, you know, how do you, if that's the system you set up for yourself, where you say, okay, I'm going to take it, we're going to take in and have access to the things we think are good and reject the things that we think are not right for us. Um, how do you know that you're right? Or how do you know, you know, how do you, how do you balance that ledger? It's just a kind of constant battle. There's a, there's a good, there's another good essay about this. I think his name is Jay Lefkowitz. His, his last name is definitely Lefkowitz from Commentary a few years ago. That's about what he calls social orthodoxy, um, which is kind of uh, his um, su- uh, uh, his synonym for modern orthodoxy. Um, orthodoxy that is highly social in nature, which all of the Orthodox Judaism, most Orthodox Judaism is, but, um, but yeah. As you were describing that, one of the things that, um, we sort of probably have to wrap up almost now, but one of the things that um, really stuck out to me was just the idea of the structures of Judaism, like the the communal and like re- required structures of living a Jewish life as kind of remedial tools for being human in a remedial way. Like we've kind of, to a certain degree, liberalism or whatever you want to call it, major- well, I don't know, I don't totally want to be a trad here, but like liberalism kind of attacks all of our normal natural law based noahide um everything is you know we can use reason and conscience to um plus you know normal natural law structures of the world to live well um all of that kind of gets messed up by contemporary many forms of contemporary life and which i would kind of identify with aspects of liberalism um and then judaism kind of comes in as a well, okay, clearly the Noahide thing isn't working out for you guys because you're, you're like the Gentiles are not doing too well. Um, and therefore Judaism is a kind of more detailed set of instructions for being human in a remedial way when you've kind of lost the ability to do that without them. It's like training wheels for being human well. Um, which, I mean, obviously the Jews as a kind of light to the nations, um, it kind of always was meant to be that. Like this is a little bit like, um, you know, <laughs> with the fall, we lost the skills of being human in- incredibly well. And God is kind of like reteaching us how to do that in a very intensive way through the history of Israel and through giving his law. Um, I don't know, but we should probably wrap this up. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys. Welcome, Leah Labresco, a dear friend of mine, a Plow contributing editor, um, author of Building the Benedict Option, and before that, Arriving at Amen. It's a pleasure to be here. We would kind of like to talk about um, all three of the pieces that you've recently written. Um, the most recent one for the disability issue is uh, called Spaces for Everybody. Um, what would a world designed for humans with and without disabilities look like? But you also wrote... Uh, a while back, about, I don't know, a year ago, uh, a piece called Dependence Towards an Illiberalism of the Weak. And then in between those two, you wrote for our Creatures issue a piece called Let the Body Testify with the slugline Whose Bodies Matter. Um, and I feel like, so, you know, as 
with so many things, like all of your work seems to have this very, um, it, it feels like a tapestry. It feels like a really integrated kind of a um, set of concerns and approach. And so um, as much as, I don't know, obviously we want to talk about the most recent piece, but I almost want to start with the oldest piece, which is the dependence piece, if you're up for doing that. Why does dependence matter? Why does dependence matter? And what is the illiberalism of the week? You know, the thing that really struck me when I started working on that piece, which was a while before I sent it to you, was how much the discussion of post-liberalism often felt like it was centered on who would ultimately hold power and how they would exercise it and not on what it's like to lack power or depend on other people's decisions. So we had this critique of liberalism as the autonomous individual, which you know, I think pretty much all the post-liberals and I agree is not an accurate depiction of what it means to be human. Humans aren't autonomous individuals. You know, we, we kind of pass into that stage for brief moments when we're wealthy enough and healthy enough and don't have enough other people we love who need us that we feel like we can do anything. But for most of our life, we're in webs of dependency, you know, either marked by our own need or the needs of other people who we care about or most often by both. And so I wanted to write about what it meant to look at post-liberalism to, to really take seriously that this account of being human, of being an individual standing alone was inaccurate. But to say then that our foundation starts from the assumption that we all are vulnerable to each other more than how will we wield power as strong post-liberal etc. So obviously, you know, one of the kind of er texts in post-liberalism is um, Alistair McIntyre's Dependent Rational Animals, where he talks about dependence as the as a kind of sine qua non of human existence. Um, and the, you know, you go in the first paragraph of this piece, which I deeply love, um, you go directly after our boy John Locke and the kind of fantasy of um, of, of basically like all humans are either 40-year-old landowning British men um, with at least no children who have any terribly severe medical conditions, if not, you know, even if he does have children, um, or you are in some kind of like condition of being an imperfect version of a 40-year-old landowning British man. Um, and that's just like, you know, as you say, this is a fantasy of what it is to be human. Um, that was not meant to be a slam against um, UK people. That was meant to be a slam against liberalism. Um, it's a little funny that John Locke is kind of the avatar of all this, as though he's uniquely wrong about this, because... You know, what you've just said, Susanna, that, you know, the, the prototypical person is a 40-year-old English landowner with no dependence that he's personally responsible for, that's still the way a lot of our society operates, you know, and that's the assumption of folks who have never directly read John Locke um, and weren't as immediately influenced by him, but that's often the focus of my other feminism substack, that we take a very narrow range of what it means to be human. In fact, a, a painfully thin range of what it means to be human. I would be very happy to be a 40-year-old English landowner with no dependents to speak of for my whole life. Uh, that's a season at best. And then we take it as the standard and we don't leave room. We don't build you know, our societal structures, the literal designs of our building to be hospitable to anyone but this narrow slice of humanity. Yeah. And I mean, and we also sort of don't allow ourselves psychologically to feel OK about ourselves unless we are, you know, to the best um, of our ability, given constraints of gender or um, not being British or not owning land. Um, you know, if we're not to the best of our ability approximating that, we feel like, oh, we're doing human humaning wrong or we're not adulting properly. And um and then we get resentful of people who, you know, make demands on us that both constrain our own liberal, you know, ability to choose to do anything, you know, because we are now obliged to them. And also they seem like weird or wrong themselves to us because they aren't, they aren't being the independent 40-year-old landowning man. 
um, that everyone really ought to be if they were doing life right. Um, and that just kind of makes everyone miserable and anxious all the time, it seems to me, and kind of guilty also. And it kind of makes everyone a little bit crazy. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. And it's it's an inappropriate offloading of responsibility. You know, I'd kind of draw a parallel yeah. just as in throughout the pandemic, you know, things that really are systemic problems are kind of offloaded to individual responsibility. We're seeing it right now where on the one hand, you know, everyone is told to get rapid tests, but they aren't actually available. Um, and our government yeah. kind of says, well, you know, this is a question of individual responsibility. You know, it's up to you to jump to this ideal that we've made it impossible to meet. Um, mm -hmm. And in the same way, women especially, but we're not the only ones, are told to catch up to an ideal of this autonomous man with no dependents, or at least a wife to take care of his dependents for them, that is impossible to meet, wouldn't be good to meet in this case, not even for men is it good to be as autonomous as that ideal implies. But the more we kind of hold that up as a false ideal, the more anything that feels unfair or exhausting or impossible feels like it's our personal failure to live up to that ideal, rather than an injustice that that ideal was presented as something worth striving for at all. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm sort of thinking about like, if you are sort of in the position to strive for that ideal of independence, you know, reductio, that's going to be an emotional independence too. That's going to mean like you're not bound to someone um, who's being upset with you might make you feel upset. And therefore, like the ultimate Lockean man would probably be a man who is, you know, only married in the sense of like having a kind of AI wife who, you know, can can order seamless for him because she wouldn't make any emotional demands and she also wouldn't sort of require him to fulfill any commitments that he had made in the past. Like his own past self can't even be, you know, allowed to tyrannize him. Well, Suzanne, I know we're both big Sondheim fans and I think this is a lot of what the whole musical company builds to, the idea that to live fully, we have to give up some of our freedom and some of our autonomy and be vulnerable to someone else. And that may make our life worse as you know it's measured day to day sometimes right you know you bring someone into your life who you love and then their wounds hurt you you've extended your being over someone else and now there's more yeah. of you and it's all exposed but yeah the converse is terrible for us our goal is not to limit our exposure it's to enter into exposure deliberately joyfully and uh, generously I'm going to work so hard to not take the company bait because actually we have a pitch in about specifically that, that I'm, I'm going to police, <laughs> I'm going to complete this on the, the, the company conversation oh my and I will interrupt. He's imposing <clears throat> discipline here. I will, yeah, I will be, I'll be that 40 year old guy <clears throat> right about now. So uh, Leah, could you tell us, give us some examples of what the illiberalism of the week looked like? So we've talked about Locke. We've talked, we, you know, even uh, one of my colleagues here, um, when he first read the essay, um, said illiberalism, isn't that Victor Orban? Um, so tell us what, what are you arguing for? And, and I think each, as Susanna said, each of your essays kind of builds on that essential idea of embracing the idea that we are dependent on each other. And this is where I really do want to pivot back to that essay from the disability issue on design, because there are kind of two models, one of which I would say is the more liberal ideal model of how we accommodate people who are different. And one that is a, you know, if not fully illiberal, at least a non-individualistic model, uh, doesn't have that much to do with Viktor Orban. Uh, the individualist model says, well, when someone's disabled, you know, there's something wrong and our goal is to restore them to the way we think of the median person as acting. And so that often means accommodations that are meant to, you know, give some level of support for someone with a disability to interact with the world exactly the way a, a median person, I would say, would rather than a normal person. And one of the examples that's discussed in the books I reviewed is a woman who has a limb difference and has this kind of very high tech hand that she can attach that has articulated fingers and it's meant to let her do things the way I would, since I have kind of the standard set of hands. And most of the time she leaves that hand in a drawer and instead she's attached zip ties to handles in her house so that 
with her limb difference, instead of operating a handle built for you know, the average human hand, she's operating a modified handle that works well for her. You know, the design of her house starts from the assumption that there's a wide range of people and that we meet people as welcome guests where they are rather than there's a narrow ideal of what it means to be human um, and it looks like five fingers you know and it looks like a specific set of handles and then for other folks kind of discussed you know the accommodation is i don't want to go through the day alone accommodation means not lifting me to autonomy but making room for the caregiver i need to operate in the world and that's where we run into different problems like handicapped bathroom stalls that are wide enough for a wheelchair, but not wide enough for an aide to come in with you with the wheelchair, because we assume that having an aide is not the goal, that if you're out in the world, the goal is to move through the world by yourself. We don't leave room for need and dependence and that people operate as more than one person, you know, we can't cleave off the needs into this is the need of this individual. Mm -hmm. And practically speaking, yeah, yeah. one thing I loved, um, I kind of hosted a discussion of that plow article on other feminisms. And one of the authors, Sarah Hendren, recommended visitability design, which is just a set of construction standards for making sure a home is visitable. That, you know, a variety of people can enter it, that it has a zero step entrance, you know, doors that are wide enough for wheelchairs or other mobility aids. Um, and that we just don't build this way. There's an assumption that not everyone is welcome in our homes. Design as hospitality is something that, um, I don't know, uh, just basically design as, as a statement of welcome is something that I think is really a powerful way to think about it um, because there's part of me that does want to maintain this kind of sense that like not that I want not that I am a liberal not that I want to judge people against the standard of absolute independence but um, there are different sort of there there's actual suffering and there's actual like you know, sometimes people do have health conditions that mean that they're not thriving in a particular way, but that doesn't mean that they can't thrive as human beings. And one of the ways that we do thrive as human beings is in being is in welcoming and being welcomed. And so it seems to me that like thinking about design um, as welcome is a way to say, all right, and we're not saying that like a kind of, you know, a particular disability is not, does not entail suffering or, you know, in you know, if you are not physically well, that doesn't mean that you're not thriving in that way. But if you weren't, you know, in a position to be welcomed or to welcome, that would be not thriving in another way, um, which is arguably more important. Where I want to push back a little, is I think thriving and suffering are just not opposite ends of a spectrum. And we sometimes talk about it that way. We can have a great deal of suffering um, alongside, you know, moments of being welcome, simply because suffering is not totally excisable from a human life. I think that's true. Um, I mean, I, that's obviously true. And then the way that you deal with suffering and the way that you kind of um, expect it or the way that you kind of like allow life to be imperfect um, without, without thinking that that means that you are somehow doing life wrong, um, I think is an important point. Um, why don't we now turn to um your piece the piece that you did for the creatures issue which is let the body testify um the subtitle is whose bodies matter um is there could you sort of uh give a brief overview of that absolutely so this is a lot about um the different ways that people suffer or experience the world and how difficult it is when not all of those forms of suffering or navigating the world are acknowledged. So I start with the example, which is, I'll say a kind of upsetting example, which is that we just didn't take seriously that newborns could feel pain for a long while. And that's because they, they couldn't articulate it in a way that we were prepared to recognize. So people did surgery on newborns without anesthesia, without as much pain medication as you would um, on a comparably sized adult. 
And the reason was that their pain was dismissed. And obviously the newborns weren't silent. They were making it very clear they were in pain and their reactions and their you know, yelling. Um, but it was dismissed as reflex because mm. they weren't able to articulate their pain um, in a way doctors were prepared to recognize. You know, and this kind of occurs before birth as well, when you know, expressions of what we treat as pain in anyone else provided they accompany them with the comment, I'm in pain, are written off as reflex. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, we don't grow out of having pain dismissed as much as you might hope. Women persistently find that their pain is under medicated and undertaken seriously by doctors. And part of that is because we, again, have a narrow sense of what pain looks like, of what being human looks like. And then we push people out of those categories if they can't articulate their experience in a way we're prepared to recognize. So it's not uncommon for women to kind of translate their pain or translate their experience into something that a doctor or a friend or a boss will treat as legitimate because it resembles more the median experience or the expected experience of pain. A lot of folks with chronic illness will uh, find themselves not reporting all their symptoms because if they discuss everything that's wrong, they worry a doctor will dismiss them out of hand. They go, okay, well, how can I sound like someone who's healthier than I am so that someone will take me seriously? Because if I sound too much like a sick person, they're not going to hear me out. One of the things that you, um, I mean, obviously we are a Christian podcast and there's not a way to talk about questions of um, suffering without talking about the fact that Jesus suffered and that we are, in fact, one of the things that we're kind of guaranteed as Christians is suffering and that that suffering doesn't, um, is not useless and it does not have, a, there's, there's meaning in it. There's not a, there's, it doesn't point towards meaninglessness, but towards meaning. Um, is, how do we negotiate between that and the good desire to alleviate suffering where it should be alleviated? I think part of that starts with, um, hearing people suffering, right? To, to alleviate suffering, often the first thing we do that alleviates or ameliorates it is being present with someone who is suffering as they actually are, removing that scrim of, well, here's how I'm packaging or presenting my suffering to you so that you can believe in it or have sympathy for it. So I think starting there, um, one, one Christian writer who I really love is St. Francis de Sales. And He's a great encouragement that we don't have to needlessly embrace suffering. He has a moment where he's writing to give spiritual advice to a pregnant woman who's been trying to follow fasting rules. And he says, what are you doing? You know, you, know, you have, and he says, holocausts enough to offer, you know, that the kinds of suffering that's enjoined on her by being present, by being pregnant is already enough to serve God. She doesn't have to layer additional sufferings on it. And I think that's almost always the case, that we have distinct forms of suffering that will always find us. It's inevitable. So we don't have to cling to a form of suffering we're currently enduring if someone can help us relinquish it. We, we can trust that God will provide more suffering for us if that's what we need. One of the things that is a big part of your life and, and your sort of intellectual project is this attempt to articulate, um, to find and articulate what you've called other feminisms. And I want to read a little passage, um, a short passage from your um, Whose Bodies Matter essay that I think kind of points towards one of the places that you go with that. You write, a world that holds up independence as the ideal offers us two rival duties, to obscure our dependence or, and to be resentful of it. No woman can lightly assent to the illusion of autonomy. Because a baby is alien to the world of self-ownership, every woman's citizenship in that imaginary republic is tenuous. A world of auton autonomous individuals can't acknowledge both woman and child simultaneously. Um, you know, there's a reason that John Locke's imaginary 40-year-old landowning person is a man. Um, women kind of, by their, by their nature, by, you know, either being pregnant or having, knowing that they have the potential to be pregnant or that that's, you know, built into their bodies in some way, kind of give the lie to the idea that independence is the the norm in any in any way for human beings like this is not how human beings come into the world it's not how they go out of the world for women you know sharing your you know having your body be a place of welcome for another person in a way that 
totally subverts all categories of individualism and um, rights and autonomy. That's just that that's part of um, that's part of our experience. How is how are you? Can you sort of describe the part of your intellectual project that is looking at specifically what it means to be a woman and um, questions of feminism through those lenses? Well, I think this is where if if the ideal of being human is being autonomous and being relatively invulnerable, relatively buffered to any demands anyone else can make on you, then it's clear women aren't human or are very bad at being human. And so if we want to accept this Lockean view, we have to kind of cast women out of what it means to be human, as well as babies, the elderly, etc. And that's why you see kind of such a assumption in our culture today that being a woman is a problem that has to be solved by women, uh, that women are the problem, is that particularly in our attitudes towards fertility and pregnancy, where you know, in discussions of abortion, you know, becoming pregnant is always discussed as though it's an unfair trick um, or kind of things not shaking out the way they should, when in fact women mostly are fertile, right? That's part of who we are. And instead the assumption is, well, we should turn that off as quickly as possible because we live in a society that isn't hospitable to women who ha have their natural fertility. It's a, it's a dangerous power. It's kind of a, an error. We have to fix it by turning it off and then just turning it back on when it would work out well for often our employers, right? Even more than for us. And I think that just describes a world that you know can't possibly be a feminist victory, can't possibly be a world that's hospitable to women, because it starts with the presumption that women as women are bad and have to be fixed, that women as women cannot be accommodated, that we've gone so fundamentally wrong in being vulnerable to others' needs that we can't be full citizens in this autonomous republic. Do you want to sort of describe what the project of the Other Feminisms newsletter is, just to sort of give our readers a little bit of a taste of that? Absolutely. You know, it's a sustained conversation about what it means to advocate for women as women in a world that often views us as deficient men who need to do a better job of being less deficient men. And so that really does bring in a range of people because women feel that pinch in so many different ways, in ways that employment is designed, um, in our abortion culture, et cetera. So I have a number of readers who disagree with each other on certain specific issues, on religion, on abortion, et cetera, but they've all run into this pressure somewhere of a world that tells them being a woman is a problem that has to be fixed by being less like a woman. So I really appreciate having that community of readers to write for, to send me articles, to send me their comments, and to just see all the different ways this pressure is applied. And of course, there are some guy readers too, both because they care about this as a matter of justice, and because as I've said, a culture that's hostile to women in this way is hostile to women in, as a class, but it turns that, you know, uncharitable eye on anyone who has needs or who cares about the needs of others. You know, so a man who's thinking about how to take care of an elderly parent is often interested in the discussions we're having about vulnerability and dependency, even if he's not, you know, experiencing the directly through the lens of fertility the way a woman might be. So you are, even before you were a Christian, you were a virtue ethicist. And I wonder if you could talk about, there's a, there's a kind of a tension that I sometimes see, um, and I, I think it's a good tension. I don't think it means that either of the positions is wrong, but there's a kind of tension that I sometimes see between virtue ethics, at least as it's classically understood, and the kind of um, openness to vulnerability, openness to the need for grace, um, openness to the goodness of being human, even in the face of imperfection, um, physical and otherwise, that... Um, I think is kind of the other, you know, we obviously have this, um, we have the, both the Greek and the kind of more Hebrew um, branches of our tradition that we that kind of fight with each other sometimes, but I think fight fruitfully. Is there a way that, could you sort of discuss that kind of vir a vulnerable virtue ethics or a virtue ethics of imperfection and how that, how that's working, how that might work? Yeah, that's kind of interesting because before I was a virtue ethicist, I was a stoic. And in some ways I can see the 
the answer more clearly through stoicism than through virtue ethics because in stoicism every imperfection or every difficulty is a chance to practice resignation um and so you know uh a problem like i've sprained my ankle i depend on others more now and it hurts to walk is not a terrible thing for a stoic because it reminds you i have the gift of an ankle and i may not always have it and i should be grateful for it but understand i can't hold on to it permanently and i think that is a genuine virtue kind of that the stoics put at the heart of their philosophy and it's not the utmost virtue and virtue ethics but it's a good one to develop which is that we hold the things that we've been given loosely knowing that they're less at the core of who we are our strengths our gifts um even our excellences you know when it comes to something like i'm a very good singer is less at the core of who we are than i'm a beloved child of god i'm a creature i depend on him and i depend on other people so any form of suffering or setback can be an opportunity for growth and virtue if it's reminding us at the core of who I am is my dependency more than some of the gifts I've been given in the midst of that dependency. Well, Leah, you, you know, this I am quite sure will be the first of many conversations that we have with you on this podcast. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. And I do urge all of our listeners to immediately subscribe to Other Feminisms. Um, and as, as well to go and uh, check out Leah's books. All right. Thank you guys so much. Thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes or your app of choice and rate us. Tune in next week to find out what people have been hassling us about and what we've learned. In other words, next week is our Q&A and brooding flexions by the editors episode. Mm -hmm.